Thank you very much indeed for coming. Welcome to those of you on the live stream. I'm delighted to have here Mark Drakeford, First Minister of Wales, to talk about 20 years of devolution and what we should make of it, and particularly what Wales should make of it and what the next 20 years indeed might look like. And he, as you know, has been First Minister since the end of last year, but has uh, first became an Assembly member in, in uh, 2011, taking over from Rodri Morgan in uh, Cardiff West and was appointed to the Welsh Cabinet in March 2013 as Minister for Health and Social Services and uh, did a range of things after that, including being the, the Minister for Brexit. So a very warm welcome indeed, Mark. And we first will listen to what you've got to say. I'm going to fire some questions at him. And I have every confidence hearing the buzz here beforehand that there are going to be a lot of questions from you as well. And we will leave good time for that, but finish at 2 o'clock. Mark, good to have you with us. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for being here uh, this afternoon. Thanks particularly to the Institute for Government for its uh, continuing interest uh, in Wales. I know that my predecessor, Karen Jones, spoke here on a number uh, of occasions, used it as a platform for developing a set of ideas about how devolution might continue to develop uh, 20 years on from its uh, foundation. Uh, and I look uh, forward to this opportunity to follow in that extent to his footsteps. Uh, now, if you're new to a job, uh, it's always useful uh, to have advice uh, from others and some suggestions as to what you ought to be uh, thinking about. And the Institute of Government uh, helpfully supplied uh, some of that in the very earliest days when I was just about to become uh, First Minister. There was a blog from the interview by Lucy Balsamidis. Here in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Lucy put three questions uh, for the incoming uh, First Minister. Three things that the new Welsh First Minister uh, needed to do. And I'm going to begin uh, what I have to say uh, this afternoon by briefly commenting on each of those uh, three things before it leads me into the rest of what I have to say. Uh, so the first thing that the blog said a new Welsh First Minister needed to do was to defend the Welsh devolution settlement. Now I think that at first glance that might seem a bit odd uh, because the long history of the first 20 years of devolution in Wales The, the long history has been uh, that devolution has been both broadened and deepened. If you wanted the sort of meta theme of the first 20 years, it is a movement from those very early days when we did indeed debate the smaller Egyptian potato order on the floor of the National Assembly, there not being a lot else to talk about, uh, to today when we are a full lawmaking uh, assembly where we raise in taxation five billion pounds from the Welsh public in decisions that are made on the floor of the National Assembly. So in that sense, why defend? Uh, well, I'm afraid it's an early appearance for the B word uh, because Brexit, I think, provides the context in which that question is a sensible uh, one. Uh, now, you will no doubt uh, remember the advice that the poet Philip Larkin uh, said that uh, the effect that parents had on their children. Uh, and I think that Brexit uh, has some of the same tendencies in relation to the constitution of the United Kingdom. Uh, it, offer us, it offers us both the faults we've always had and now adds some new ones in just for us. Uh, so the fault lines we've always had uh, I think come to the surface uh, in Brexit. We're very lucky uh, in Wales. We live uh, sheltered lives. We almost never meet a real Tory. Uh, uh, you've got to come to London, uh, really, uh, to see the Conservative uh, Party blue in tooth and claw. Uh, and my experience of being in the room now with many uh, Conservative uh, Cabinet Ministers is that there remain a considerable number for whom Brexit is an opportunity to return the United Kingdom 
to the place it was in 1973, uh, in which the dreadful mistake of devolution uh, can somehow be brushed under the carpet uh, again. Uh, and those fault lines, I think, have always uh, been there. Uh, they've been submerged in the first 20 years of devolution, and Brexit brings those underlying tensions back to the surface, and it adds in a whole new set of challenges, it seems to me, as to how the United Kingdom is to go on successfully operating when the EU rulebook, the common rulebook that we have all observed with our devolved responsibilities in agriculture, in environment and so on, when that common rulebook is no longer there, then how is the United Kingdom to operate uh, successfully. So that question, that first question about defending the devolution settlement turns out actually to be a very real question uh, indeed. Uh, the second thing that uh, Lucy said in that blog was that there would be a need to strengthen the legitimacy of the Welsh Assembly. Uh, and when I read that, uh, I was quite definitely taken back to the very earliest days uh, of devolution. Uh, I arrived in the National Assembly for Wales in around April of its first year. So before the first year uh, was at an end. And it is difficult uh, now, I think, to look back at that very rocky beginning that devolution uh, had. A very closely run uh, referendum, a first assembly elections in which no administration with a majority on the floor of the assembly uh, was produced. And by the time that I arrived, three of the four party leaders who had started that year were no longer with us. One had been defeated on the floor of the assembly. Uh, one had uh, been defenestrated in a palace coup inside his own party. And a third was appearing before Knighton Crown Court charged with offences involving a pizza and wanting to spend more time with a family that was not his own. <laughs> uh, now, in those uh, early months, the Assembly seemed to the outsider, I think, a place that was entirely obsessed with what went on its, inside its own boundaries. And when I arrived uh, and started working with ministers at that time, I thought it was by no means a foregone conclusion that this was an institution that would survive. People seemed to me in many ways at the end of their tethers as they went into that first uh, summer. So the need to strengthen the legitimacy of the institution has been a genuine challenge from the very beginning. Uh, now I was lucky enough, I went there to work with uh, Rodri Morgan as his advisor. And Rodri's uh, reputation with the public was always as the person you'd most like to sit next to uh, in the pub. Uh, because you'd be guaranteed a lively conversation and an interest in almost any topic that you could uh, think of. And all of that was absolutely true. But the side of him that was less apparent to the public always seemed to me to be the deeply serious way in which he approached the whole business of devolution. And from the very beginning, he saw it as his responsibility to reach out to those people who had not voted in favour of devolution and to persuade them that this institution belonged to them every bit as much as it belonged to anybody else. In that first assembly term, an incredibly uh, busy and challenging term when you're establishing an institution for the very first time, he decided to make himself the Minister for North Wales. Uh, and that involved every single month travelling to North Wales, appearing in front of what was then the North Wales Regional Committee, trying to give confidence to people in different parts of Wales that the new institution was as interested in them as anybody else, that it would focus on the things that mattered to them as much as it would focus on anything that mattered to any other part of Wales, and to secure the legitimacy of the institution in that way. 
And many years later, I do remember asking him uh, what he thought his own most memorable part in devolution had been. And he said to me that it was winning the second referendum, the referendum of a decade later, in which full lawmaking powers were transferred to the National Assembly and with a significant majority in front of that proposition in almost every part of Wales. I think that sense of securing legitimacy was something that mattered very much to him and it has to matter, it has to matter to current Assembly members and governments as well. It's why we will legislate to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds to enable them to vote in the next assembly and local government elections. Uh, it's why my party remains committed in whatever shape the future assembly takes to being sure that the degree of proportionality that we have now as a minimum is sustained into whatever future arrangements there are because in that way we are able, I believe, to go on persuading people in Wales that while they will not always, of course, agree with what we do, while they will not always be satisfied with the decisions that the Assembly makes, the fact that the decisions are in their hands, the fact that things that matter to people in Wales and affect people only in Wales are now in the hands only of people who live in Wales, that fundamental principle, I think, is firmly embedded in our democratic landscape. And by the time the next Assembly elections come around, you will have to be over 40 years of age to have voted at a time when the National Assembly did not exist. So the third, the third question that was posed in that uh, blog was that an incoming First Minister must decide where he wants devolution to go. And that's what I want to focus on uh, most of all uh, this afternoon. I want to be clear with you that the government that I lead is fiercely devolutionist. We believe absolutely in the principle that I just outlined to you, that those decisions that affect only people who live in Wales should be made by people who live in Wales. But we are also a government that believes that Wales' future is best secured by being part of a successful United Kingdom. And I think that puts us on a distinct, and indeed I think I might argue, a unique uh, place in the political spectrum. It's clearly different from that of the Scottish government or indeed uh, that of Plaid Cymru uh, in Wales. The Scottish uh, government elected on a prospectus that was there to take Scotland out of the United Kingdom. Uh, Plaid Cymru in its most uh, recent uh, months, a party that says that independence for Wales will be the top priority in the manifesto that they will put before people in Wales at the next Assembly election. On the other side, uh, you have a government in Westminster, which I think, while it is certainly unionist, it has a deep and profound ambivalence about devolution. And that's part of what I said uh, earlier. Now, I would characterise uh, the attitude towards devolution of the current United Kingdom as that of a grace and favour approach to devolution. Uh, that devolution has been given to us. Uh, indeed, a cabinet minister said exactly that uh, to me. We gave you devolution as though it was entirely uh, their gift. And the uh, corollary of that, of course, is a deep uh, belief that what has been given can be taken away uh, again. That devolution is fine so long as those people who have been given 
devolved powers behave themselves properly, do the things that the UK government would be happy to see uh, done. And if we do that, if we behave ourselves properly, that in this grace and favour model, then out of the goodness of its own heart, the UK government allows some powers of self-government, provided that they are carefully limited, provided that they are always provisional. Uh, if you want to see this script uh, writ large, then, uh, and only on those grounds, uh, I recommend uh, the speech by Michael Gove, the astonishing speech by Michael Gove to the Conservative Party conference uh, in Scotland uh, over the weekend. Uh, you know, I make all allowances that uh, are necessary for the fact that it was a speech made to a party political uh, audience. I make every allowance for the fact that it was uh, a leadership campaign uh, speech. But imagine, imagine for a moment uh, what the reaction would be if a Scottish First Minister had said in reverse the things that Mr Gove said about the UK government being able to move into Scotland and set up rival sources of expenditure uh, and authority on things that are devolved to Scotland. Imagine the Scottish First Minister announcing uh, that she intended to open an army base uh, somewhere in Hampshire, uh, using Scottish government uh, money, uh, but on a topic for which Scotland has no devolved responsibility and in a place outside Scotland uh, too. Uh, Mr Gove, uh, I don't think saw any of those uh, uh, possibilities, but he did believe uh, in that grace and favour way uh, that a UK government remains capable of doing anything, anywhere, and has the legitimacy uh, to do so. Now, uh, we've worked through that, uh, of course, already in the debates about the EU withdrawal uh, bill when it was first introduced in 2000. And 17, the Prime Minister said then, I see she's been saying again uh, today, that uh, Brexit would lead to a great strengthening of powers at the devolved uh, level. But the practical action that her government proposed was that all the powers coming back, uh, if that's what you think they are, uh, I'll pause on that for a moment, but assuming that they are coming back uh, from Brussels, that they would come to London uh, and they would stay in London. And they would stay in London for an indefinable uh, period uh, of time until they would be dribbled out uh, to an extent that it was impossible uh, to identify back to devolved uh, administrations. Now, we worked very hard. We worked very hard with the Scottish uh, government, as we have on many aspects of uh, Brexit, to secure substantial changes to that bill. But it was an uphill uh, struggle. You know, the starting point uh, of the UK government was that everything would be in their hands, that they would make every decision uh, thereafter, and that at some time uh, in some distant and uh, many times promised land, uh, some of those things would eventually make their way down uh, to devolved administrations. Uh, that's what I mean uh, by uh, a, an approach to devolution which is grace and favour uh, in its uh, DNA and you know, much as we would like to avoid it, uh, we fear that we are about to embark on another round uh, of these uh, difficulties uh, in relation to the proposed shared prosperity uh, fund uh, where uh, a friendless fund as far as I can uh, tell uh, but one which aspects of the UK government appear determined to press uh, ahead with. Uh, let me say a bit more now, if I could, about devolution after uh, Brexit. I want to be clear, the Welsh Government campaigned to remain in the European Union. Uh, I've been asked several times over the last few days by in interviews and so on, what is my own personal greatest regret? Uh, of the 20 years of devolution and it's not a difficult question uh, for me because uh, our failure to persuade enough people in Wales to vote in favour of continued membership of the European Union would probably uh, be, or probably would undoubtedly be at the top uh, of my uh, list. Uh, but 
it is inevitable, it's absolutely inevitable that whatever form Brexit takes, that it has an impact upon the future arrangements that are needed to create a successful United Kingdom. Uh, either we can continue with the sort of approach to devolution that I described to you a while uh, ago, that devolution should simply amount to a special set of governance arrangements for the devolved nations, that we should be allowed to have the benefit of having our own government and our own legislatures, but always subject to parliamentary sovereignty, always allowing Westminster to continue to legislate on all matters, even when they are formally devolved to Wales or Scotland. The corollary of that is that while devolution in Wales and Scotland has been transformative over a 20-year period, we're unrecognisable as the institution that we started off with, Westminster and Whitehall have essentially stood still. The Whitehall of 2019 is utterly recognisable. Uh, as the Whitehall of 1999. And in that sense, that geography of devolution means that while some parts of the United Kingdom have changed hugely, then others remain stuck uh, where they were at the start of devolution. And Brexit inevitably means that that will have to change. Now, I'm going to offer you just two institutional and one process example of all of this. The most obvious institutional example is the apparently unchanging expectations of the roles of the territorial uh, offices. Now, I've put Northern Ireland to one side because of the many, many different arguments that pertain in the Northern Ireland uh, context, but I really think that there is a very strong case for saying that the roles of the Wales and Scotland offices need to be radically rethought in the post-Brexit world. I'm absolutely committed to the notion that Wales needs a strong voice in Westminster and Whitehall. Do I think that that is the function that the Wales office now uh, discharges? Well, I couldn't say uh, that to you in all frankness. I say it not because, or not only uh, because at least, of the record of the current Secretary of State uh, for Wales, but I think the institutional failure to adapt to the development of devolution means that those offices now serve more often to confuse than to clarify, to get in the way of the process of consultation and negotiation between devolved governments and the UK, uh, and UK government uh, departments. And that what ought to be the routine stuff of public administration between devolved administrations and UK uh, departments now has an extra hurdle that we have to get through. And that extra hurdle is represented by the territorial office. A territorial office that has neither the knowledge, nor the resources, nor the expertise to make a distinctive contribution to those conversations, but still sees itself as having the right to intrude into the way that those everyday conversations uh, are carried out. The time has come for, I believe, a fundamental uh, rethink and repositioning of the way that the Whitehall response to devolution is shaped into uh, the future. My second institutional uh, example is one that won't surprise anybody here, uh, I'm sure, uh, and that is the way that the House of Lords is refocused for uh, the future. We've worked really closely with the House of Lords, more closely I think than we ever have uh, before, in trying to overturn some of those initial propositions uh, in the Withdrawal uh, 
bill and worked very successfully with them uh, too. But nobody, I think, can sensibly defend the composition of the House of Lords, yet when proposals came forward last in 2012 for its reformation, they came forward in apparent ignorance and certainly uninformed by other constitutional changes. A reformed upper house of parliament should be established with a membership which takes proper account of the multinational character of the union. And that will mean that its membership will have to be based not simply on population. It will have, it should have, explicit responsibilities for ensuring that the interests of the devolved territories and their institutions are protected and properly taken into account in UK parliamentary legislation. I don't think any of that is controversial. I don't think it cuts across the arguments that many others make. There's no sign at all of it actually happening. And that's, I think, another example of the way in which arrangements and London have failed to move to recognise the new constitutional uh, realities. One very short uh, example of uh, process. So the UK government recently uh, concluded an agreement with Spain on the rights of Spanish nationals post-Brexit. Uh, it gives Spanish nationals uh, the right to vote in Welsh local elections. It did so without any reference at all to Wales. Now, as it happens in the substantive uh, issue, that doesn't matter because we would have exactly wanted that uh, to happen. But here was a UK government concluding an agreement in which rights that belong to the National Assembly for Wales were bartered away without a single thought for the fact that those were not responsibilities that those UK ministers had in their hands at the time that that agreement uh, was made. Uh, and there will be more agreements uh, of this sort. And what if a UK government were to agree a set of rights for citizens from some other part of the world, which we did not agree with in Wales? What if they were to invent a set of rights not only in relation to voting, but in relation to the health service, or to education services, or rights to housing? All of those things are things that belong to the National Assembly and to the Welsh Government. It simply cannot be right that UK ministers are so blindsided to where responsibilities lie 20 years after the start of devolution that they were able to conclude that agreement with no reference to Welsh ministers at all. And we really cannot continue with a situation in which the UK government in its conduct of inter international relations proceeds without any effort to involve the devolved administrations in that process. If the United Kingdom is truly a union of territories, if it is not a grace and favour nation, but a voluntary association of four nations, each with their own responsibilities, then the way that the United Kingdom prospers in the future is by having a negotiated space where those things can come together, where ministers from different parts of the United Kingdom are able to reach agreement, where there is independent mechanism for when agreement cannot uh, be reached, and where the United Kingdom operates on the basis of that dispersed sovereignty, rather than on the basis that there is only one source uh, of sovereignty, which whenever you like is able to be wheeled onto the stage to trump everything else. So as I explained uh, at the beginning, uh, the government that I lead is both devolutionist, but also one that strongly supports a successful United Kingdom. And I think that that puts us firmly in the place that Welsh public opinion continues to uh, occupy. 
Do I think that that means that the health of that union is in good order? That we can take it for granted that we wouldn't ask the same sorts of questions of the United Kingdom that Lucy asked of an incoming Welsh uh, First Minister? Uh, I'm afraid uh, that I don't think that that uh, is the case. For the first time in my political uh, lifetime, I think that the future of the United Kingdom itself is under real prospect of not surviving as a four-way union. We face the possibility of a second Scottish independence referendum and the possibility of a vote that might lead to a united uh, Ireland. Uh, for those of us who wish to preserve the union, then Giovanni de Lampedusa's famous dictum applies, famous probably only in somewhere like the Institute of Government, I, <laughs> I, I imagine. Uh, but what he said was, you'll recall, that if we want things to stay as they are, then everything must change. In other words, if we want to preserve the United Kingdom as a successful entity, then standing still, in the way that I have argued Westminster and Whitehall have, is not an option. And in the end, I have absolutely come to believe that the Union is under greatest of threats from those who describe themselves as Unionists. Because their failure to recognise the realities of 20 years of post-devolution United Kingdom is what is putting the future of the United Kingdom in peril. It doesn't have to be like that. It's not inevitable. Uh, of course, under the pressure of Brexit, there are new and, in some ways, promising uh, examples emerging of the way that the United Kingdom can be conducted. In, in a very uh, unusual day, just before uh, Easter, I came uh, to London. I met the Scottish uh, First Minister. I met the Prime Minister. I attended a meeting of a subcommittee of the UK Cabinet. Now, there's an institutional uh, novelty. Scotland and Wales taking part in meetings of the UK uh, Cabinet. Uh, and then I attended a meeting of the Shadow Cabinet uh, on the same uh, day. It seemed to me to sum up some of the ways in which the constitutional machinery uh, can be made to move under the urgent pressures uh, of Brexit. There is work going on through the Joint uh, Ministerial Committee at Prime Ministerial uh, level to review intergovernmental relations. It's disappointingly slow. It's almost impossible to attract from UK ministers, overwhelmed as they are by Brexit, the sort of urgency and energy that I believe is needed for this agenda. But this could be that constitutional moment for the United Kingdom. The next few months could be of historic importance, not only in relation to the UK's future relationships with Europe, but the future existence of the Union itself. My predecessor, Cadwyn Jones, set out a method by which that issue could be addressed and a set of specific proposals as to how the United Kingdom could be made to operate successfully. Will that happen? For the moment, I think, the most we could say is that the jury is still out. The future of devolution and our union's future lies in a partnership approach to the governance of the United Kingdom, where we operate on the basis of parity of esteem and respect for the different responsibilities that we all hold. Uh, can we yet capture the interest, the urgency, the energy that we need to make all that happen? Well, all I can say to you from a Welsh government point of view is that we will continue wherever we have the opportunity to make that case and to look forward to another 20 years in which, from a Welsh perspective, we have a strong institution representing the needs and wishes of people in Wales while still remaining an active, committed and contributing partner 
to a united kingdom that goes on being successful as well. Dear Fabal, thank you very much indeed. Mark Draper, thank you very much indeed. A great sweep of 20 years and taking us into the, the future. Let me, let me start, uh, and Brexit is inescapable, as you said. Let me start with a point that you've arrived at at the end. Threat to the Union um, and you calling for you know, a new partnership uh, for the Unionists uh, uh, to, to recognize this. I, I, I'd like to hear a bit more about what this would actually mean. Supposing Brexit actually happens. Supposing, indeed, the UK is not part of a customs union, so Liam Fox or whoever sets out to do trade deals. What do you want the UK government to do <coughs> first with the devolved nations? Do you want a, a negotiating mandate first, that, the, that, that, that this new trade secretary doesn't go out to try and strike deals which inevitably will include uh, clauses on agriculture and the environment, because that's exactly what trade uh, negotiations uh, go, go straight to, and those are, of course, devolved. Uh, uh, competences at the moment. W what exactly are you asking? You're saying to Liam Fox, before you go well, out, do what? Well, I think our argument would be mm. that if all administrations have to be involved through the whole of that process. And when the UK government is developing its negotiating mandate, we have to be part of that discussion. And that when the UK government comes to negotiate on the basis of that mandate, that when devolved competencies are at stake, we must be in the room. Now, there's nothing unusual uh, in this. This is the way that the Canadian uh, discussions with the European Union were conducted. That when provinces uh, were directly engaged, because those negotiations involved responsibilities that lay at the provincial uh, level, then provincial governments were not just part of shaping what the Canadian government would say, they were there in the room, because mm. it is their responsibilities that are at stake. And uh, well, let me say that, trying to be fair where I can, uh, that whereas you know, Liam Fox's reputation, and I think himself <laughs> beliefs are not uh, sympathetic to devolution, uh, over the period we have found uh, that both he and his department are actually more understanding of the fact that the involvement of devolved administrations is a necessity to the successful discharge of their responsibilities. So we're not arguing to be in the room as an act of generosity. We're arguing to be in the room because those negotiations cannot be successfully concluded and quite certainly cannot be successfully implemented if the people whose responsibilities are at stake are not around that table. And the, you know, the Department for International Trade uh, has, in our experience, uh, not been at the worst end of mm. Whitehall in coming to that sort of realization. And by we in that, I would guess you mean the devolved administrations. So how, how much do you actually act as a united front? Uh, the SNP wants independence, and the Northern, uh, Northern Ireland um, they're not there at the moment. Well, uh, first of all, I guess to, to say that I think we miss Northern Ireland hugely. Uh, that at the beginning of the process, immediately after the 2016 uh, referendum, Northern Ireland were there uh, in the room. Martin McGuinness uh, representing half of uh, the administration in those very early uh, meetings. And not having them there leaves a huge gap in these discussions. Uh, Northern Ireland civil servants, in my experience, have been fantastic. They have managed somehow to find a way of staying on that line where they don't involve themselves in political uh, discussions, but they, are, they never stand back from saying things where they believe that essential interests of Northern Ireland uh, are at stake. But even when they are doing the job in the way that I think, the admirable way I think they do, not having an administration and politicians in the room has left a huge gap. Um, we have worked very closely with the Scottish government on the Brexit agenda, more closely, I would say, than on any other thing that we've worked uh, with them. Just my experience of working with Scottish ministers uh, has been this, I think. 
Of course, they have a different endpoint. You know, they uh, believe that Scotland should leave the United Kingdom and stay in the European Union, and they argue that uh, powerfully uh, all the time. But while Scotland remains in the United Kingdom, the Scottish ministers I've worked with, I think, have a pragmatic recognition that it is in the interests of the Scottish people to keep the show on the road and make it work as well uh, as it can. And so we, although we have, you know, in the end, very different views uh, of the future, we've been able to work very closely uh, together. Mm. And it's just, the, it's just the, the, the case that if, you know, if you've got places where you agree and you can argue it together, you're more likely to have some impact than if you are arguing apart. And what leverage do you have on, take the three acting together as, as you described it best, um, what leverage do the devolved administrations have on the UK government over this political, legal? Um, well, uh, I think we have different sorts of uh, leverage. Um, you know, Northern Ireland, uh, when it was in the room, the peace process mm. and the need to sustain peace on the island of Ireland is a huge piece of leverage. Um, Scotland has leverage. You know, a second referendum, uh, the possibility of leaving the United Kingdom, there's a big piece of political leverage mm. uh, there. Wales has neither of mm. those things. And in the Brexit uh, context, we don't have the fact that Wales voted to stay in the European Union either, whereas both Northern Ireland, those Northern Ireland ministers who uh, believed in that, were able to advance that, and Scotland is always able to advance that. So we are, we, you know, our position is always different. Uh, what we rely on, uh, I think, are two things, really. One is the force of the arguments that we're able to, to make. And through the Brexit period, we have published a whole series of uh, documents setting out what we believe are credible and constructive policy proposals on the big issues that Brexit uh, throws up. And we put a lot of effort and a lot of energy into trying to make those documents and those arguments, the quality of them, as good as we can possibly make them. Because we have to rely on the quality of our arguments. Uh, in a way that maybe others have mm. other things that they can rely on. Mm. And the second thing that we rely on is that we are the only unambiguous devolved administration who believes in the future of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah. gives us some space, some leverage, political uh, space, because no other devolved administration speaks with the same clarity as we are able to on that issue. On that particular point. And that gives us some... Uh, space to act in as well. If you were talking to, say, one of the, uh, the foreign media who cover Britain closely, but as a sort of exotic country now prone mm. to do incomprehensible things mm. with its government, <laughs> the words New York Times are not floating through my mind, um, how would you explain why Wales voted to leave, even though it's one of the largest beneficiaries of structural funds uh, from Europe, and indeed its farming is supported heavily mm. by subsidies? Uh, well, I, I, I don't think I have anything um, uniquely insightful to offer them beyond the struggle we all have all the time to understand what happened in 2016. Mm. Um, Wales voted not on the basis of identity. I can see Professor Richard Wing Jones. <laughs> yes, I'm desperately anxious now of trespassing into this uh, territory. And lots of things that are important to Wales, lots of things very important about Wales to me are about uh, identity. But in Brexit, places in Wales that are like places in England voted the same way. So Cardiff votes to mm. remain, it votes like Exeter or Oxford or Norwich or any city of the same sort of size where there is diversity in population, where there is a relatively buoyant economy. And places in Wales that look like the north of England vote like the north mm. of England. So social class mm. in the end turned out to be more determinative than a sense of Welshness, mm. I believe, in Brexit. And if you want me to try and sum it up in a single image, there's, uh, there's a photograph which many of us in Wales are very familiar with. You won't be here, so I'll just describe it. The photograph is in Ebu Vale. So right in the sort of South Wales uh, valleys, a place that has benefited hugely from European uh, funding. 
And the picture is of Carwin Jones, the, the, prime, the First Minister, Rodri Morgan standing next to him, the former First Minister, Paul Murphy, mm. uh, a Valleys uh, MP and a former Secretary of State uh, for Wales. And they're pointing at things, and there's a man that they're talking to in the same uh, picture. And the politicians are saying, you can see them pointing, they're saying, if it wasn't for the European Union, we wouldn't have that fantastic college, uh, which there now is in Ebbervale. Mm. You wouldn't have that fantastic new road that allows people from Ebbervale uh, to go uh, to work. They're pointing to all these things. And the person who they are speaking to, uh, what he said to them, this is what they said, what he said to them was, you can't eat a road. You can't eat a road. And what he's telling you there is, is it for him, nearly a decade into austerity, what preoccupied him was how he would have food on the table at the end of the week. And you could tell, you, tell him as much as you liked about what Europe had brought to him. His life and his prospects didn't look that promising at all. And he was sending a message in the way that he was going to vote in that referendum about the way that he felt his community and his life had been left in 2016. Cameron Jones, sitting here in September, said he thought Wales would now vote Remain. Do you agree? Um, well, uh, quite certainly, if there were to be a second referendum, just to be clear, the Welsh Government will campaign for Remain. Right. Nothing that we have seen in the last three years believes us that our advice was wrong uh, three years uh, ago. Um, uh, if, uh, I'm, I'm sticking my finger in the air like anybody else. I think Wales probably would vote to Remain. Mm. Would it be decisive? Would it be by a margin that put the issue... Uh, to bed and meant we didn't just plunge into another uh, round of acrimonious arguments about uh, you know, what the long-term future would be. Uh, my experience of being out on the doorstep uh, does not lead me to believe that those profound shifts in public opinion mm. have taken place at the margin, mm. amongst people who didn't vote because they thought it was all going to be all right, amongst young people who mm. feel that their futures have been compromised by the way that the vote uh, was conducted, yes, I think there are shifts. D would it mm. be decisive? I think that's much more difficult to be confident mm. about mm. that. Let me ask you about a uh, um, new uh, poll from um, the, the Welsh Political Barometer, which comes out regularly, um, about what people think of devolution. There's a lot of, uh, in, in Wales. Um, and as we were discussing earlier, a lot have come out for saying, look, uh, we, 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 uh, we think it's a good thing, and a uh, big uh, uh, lot, more than half, saying it should have the same powers as the Scottish Parliament. But when you get into how they think it's done, you get a much muddier picture. Too dominated by the Labour Party, that's got 43%. Too much attention to Cardiff, that's got 53%. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, simply meant more jobs for politicians, that's got nearly half. Uh, cost too much, I hear that a lot in Wales. Uh, uh, yeah, you hear that, and um, it's often difficult to work out what it's responsible for. That's got a whopping like, like nearly two thirds. Um, what do you make of this 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 picture? Everyone's glad it's there. Sure. What is it doing? And it costs a lot. Yes. Well, look. Uh, let me uh, uh, offer you uh, an optimistic gloss on it, and then a less <laughs> optimistic uh, gloss, because you know, if you're in the practical business of politics, you've got to try and stay optimistic some of the time. Uh, and actually, you know, I think. Given the nature of the current political zeitgeist, uh, given just how uh, detached and disenchanted we hear the people are from the whole of our politics, uh, the fact that over half the Welsh population would wish the National Assembly for Wales to have more powers uh, than it has uh, today, uh, I think that tells you that uh, compared to the picture I painted for you of 1999, a pretty remarkable job has been done in embedding that basic sense that people want an institution in which they can be in charge, mm. uh, that that's managed uh, to happen. Um, if I'm being less uh, optimistic, then of course you, you can't but feel, feel disappointed uh, that 20 years into devolution, it's still a struggle to uh, explain to people where divisions of responsibilities uh, lie. 
Uh, the geographical nature of Wales is a constant struggle for us. Uh, my predecessor, Rodri Morgan, used to do a small turn in which he would quote General de Gaulle as uh, saying that France was an impossible country to govern because it had more than 2,000 uh, varieties of cheese. And then Rodri would generally pause and say, and he had it lucky, mm -hmm. uh, because every bit of Wales. Uh, a wonderful thing about Wales, I'll, I'll tell you a very brief story, of going with uh, mm. Rodri and spending a morning going down a South Wales valley. We, we started in the village at the very top of the valley, and Rodri would say to people, well, you know, how are things here? And, and they, people would say to them, oh, well, see, Rodri, it's not too bad here. Uh, those poor buggers down there, and they point to the next uh, village mm. down, things are very bad down there. <laughs> things are awful down there. And then we would go down to the next uh, village, and he would ask them the same question. He would get exactly the same response. Uh, people are always anxious that people around them are not getting everything uh, mm. that, they, that they need. And distance matters in that uh, sort of way. The assembly is tucked away in the far south east Wales co uh, corner. Uh, I've had people in Rubina, those of you who don't know Cardiff, uh, Rubina is a uh, <laughs> suburb of North Cardiff, uh, talk to me about everything, everything going down there to the bay <laughs> as though it was somewhere you know, south of Australia. Uh, so the further away you get from Cardiff, the more intense those mm. feelings become. And we've, we've struggled and continue to struggle and have to work all the time to mm. erode some of those inherent sort of... Uh, ways in which people are, thank goodness, uh, thank goodness, I think, sceptical about those who leave them and always wanting things to be better. Mm. Let me just ask you quickly about public services, because uh, there's a lot of scepticism, and it comes out in the polls about whether public services, oh, there's a lot of people saying, look, more people saying they've got worse under 20 years of devolution and a consistent Welsh Labour leadership uh, than say that they've, they've got better. And uh, we debate a lot here in the Institute whether or not uh, the quality of public services in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, which has left a lot to be desired over these 20 years, should be held at the uh, obviously should be held at the door of these elected governments to, um, to some extent. Whether it should be held at the door of devolution as well. But your view, you know, health and education in Wales, yep. not what everyone would want. Sure. Okay. Well, look. L l let me just respond. I didn't respond the first time. I'm going to respond to it this time uh, to your uh, assertion that uh, Labour has dominated uh, politics. Uh, in Wales, slightly uh, as though we had sort of won it in a raffle. You know, um, actually, well, Labour has dominated politics in Wales because we have won every election that has been held since devolution. Mm -hmm. And every time people in Wales are offered an opportunity to choose between different political parties, so far, people have chosen a mm. Labour government. That's why there are Labour governments mm. in Wales, because that's what the citizens of Wales have wanted. Uh, you know, and I, I read these sort of uh, things as, as though somehow voting Labour is anti-democratic in Wales, because it hasn't given somebody else a turn. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, my view... My, it is, you know, it uh, is a democracy. You don't need, you yeah, don't no, need no, to argue no, that point. No, no. We will give you that yeah, point, yeah, but, but the sure. point is okay. about Welsh so, Labour's record. Yeah, Welsh Labour's record. So, um, let me... Uh, in a period uh, of continuity yeah, that yeah, most yeah, you know, political yeah. parties do not enjoy yeah. at all. So, um, the, there has always been a powerful attempt by uh, the UK government to portray the Welsh NHS, for example, as somehow uh, lagging behind what goes on uh, in England. Um, we have the best delayed transfers of care uh, figures in our history. The English NHS has the worst. We have our best cancer treatment figures in our history, the English NHS has the worst. You know, what the OECD said, and for the moment I would rather rely on a major study commissioned by Jeremy Hunt, paid for by Jeremy Hunt, because he was certain it would tell him that he ran a better health service than mm. anywhere else. What the OECD said, having studied it for a whole year, was that the Welsh NHS is every bit as good as any other NHS in the United Kingdom. That is their conclusion. Things we do better than anywhere else, things that we need to learn from elsewhere to do better uh, in. And I just think that's the nature of devolution. You know, I, I'm allergic myself to the idea of devolution 
in which England is set out as the sort of you know gold standard, mm. and everybody else is compared with what goes on mm. in one part of the United Kingdom. I myself have always much more believed in the living laboratory idea of devolution. It means that different things are allowed to happen in different parts of the United Kingdom, and the mature approach to that is to recognise that everywhere will be better than everywhere else in some things, mm. uh, and that what devolution ought to be about is a learning culture uh, in which we regard that as to our mutual advantage, mm. rather than it being some sort of competition in which we're marked against one another and then ranked in some sort of overall order. That is such a gross simplification and an unhelpful way, actually, of bringing about improvement. Mm. Thank you. Let's go to questions. Right, first one up was right at the back. Um, thank you for your contribution. Um, it seems to me that there might be a missing part to your four nations as uh, having parity of esteem and explanation of each other. Your penultimate remark was about the UK government commenting on English NHS performance. Uh, what lessons might you have or observations for the lack of a devolutionary settlement for England? Yeah. Right, and thank you. Would you like to say who you are for the record? Hugh Lloyd. Uh, well, look, thank you very much uh, for that question. I, I thought long and hard about whether I could smuggle into uh, the speech a couple of pages on that huge missing part of what I've been talking about uh, here, which is English uh, devolution. English devolution, which seems to me to be conducted in this entirely incoherent uh, way, uh, in which, um, in a way that is very different from the outside to understand different levels of responsibility are being offered to different geographical entities in different parts uh, of England. I think lots of the conversation that uh, I've been trying to have today would be different if they were a coherent attempt to devolve decision making in England to more uh, local levels. Uh, I'm a slight veteran of the John Prescott North of, uh, Northeast uh, referendum. Uh, I went there uh, for a whole day with uh, Rodri Morgan on the rather bleak streets of Newcastle trying to persuade people that this would be a, a good thing. So, you know, it's not entirely the, the fault of governments, is it? Where, whether there has been an appetite uh, for it, mm. uh, genu genuinely, mm. uh, and whether there is a sense of identity mm. that is strong enough for people to feel that sense of connectedness, which I, for all the reservations of the poll, I think people in Wales mm. have an understanding of what Wales is and what to be Des living in Wales. Despite all the differences you've yes. described from street to yes. street. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's come here. I'm going to try and squeeze in. Just, Charles, just a sorry. Charles Canoole, um, crossbench peer and resident of Scotland. Uh, you, towards the end of your speech, you came to the Intergovernmental Relations Review process, now 14 months old. And in answer to a question last week uh, in the Lords, Lord Duncan of Springbank said that the review would be out soon. And I wondered whether, um, two things. First is whether, in fact, you had any idea of where the review was going towards. And secondly is whether you could help us construe the word soon. <laughs> uh, well, um, it, it wouldn't be soon as in holding your breath. I certainly don't think that. All governments are very prone to this. I sometimes used to joke that in, in the Welsh government, early spring is sort of January, whereas late spring is November. Uh, so we're all capable of stretching uh, our senses of time. Uh, I, I, we have no signs that I know of uh, that there is anything imminent to emerge from it. We had a brief discussion of it at a JMC plenary at, in December. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, the review has been parceled out amongst the, the nations with different administrations leading on different aspects uh, of it. Um, even an interim report, even a summing up of where progress has been made so we can see where the difficulties still lie, uh, would be very helpful because it would give us some ammunition in the efforts we are trying to make to concentrate some minds on it. And just to say, I think the best people that we meet in the UK government, and there are good people in the UK government, of course there are, and we're lucky enough sometimes to be working uh, with them. My experience is not that they don't recognise these issues, but that the overwhelming experience of Brexit means that they spend from dawn till dusk 
spinning plates, mm -hmm. somehow keeping going, dealing with the latest uh, crisis. And even though they know that they ought to be finding time to be thinking about all these sorts of things, those difficulties drive it off the agenda, even for those people who, I think, given an opportunity, would approach it seriously and in a spirit of wanting to, to make some proper progress. Great. Right at the back. Hi, uh, Rydian Jones. I work at PwC. Um, good afternoon, First Minister, and thank you for your speech. Uh, you mentioned that you didn't get your mandate, uh, or your several mandates now, uh, in a raffle, but you did get them in a voting system which has given you almost a majority in every election on about 34, 35% of the vote. Um, currently, there's a, an assembly reform bill going through the... Uh, going through the assembly. That is based on recommendations by an expert panel. For some reason, that reform doesn't include reforming the voting system, even though the, the panel recommended that the voting system be reformed. Um, can you give us an insight into why that wasn't included in the current reform bill and when that reform will take place? Um, in particular, given the fact that there's an assembly election in two years, uh, will we get a new voting system in time for that? or? Will you, will you delay it a bit further to give you another, another mandate, perhaps? Thank you very much. Um, I don't think it'll be there uh, for the next Assembly uh, term. Uh, I'm nowhere near as cynical uh, as you as to why that would be uh, the case. Uh, look, look, you know, uh, I think you have to think more carefully than that uh, about the way in which the Labour Party in Wales gave up a system that would have guaranteed it not nearly being in a majority, but always being in a majority. And it is a very, very rare political party that has been willing, consciously, to give up a system that was in its own self-interest. Now, personally, I have always believed in proportional representation. Uh, I am glad we have the degree of proportionality uh, that we have. And I'm very happy to have a debate inside my own party and with others about whether the McAllister uh, Review is an opportunity to do more in that way uh, in the future. Uh, but the first thing uh, that I think uh, I have to be sure of is that we don't go backwards in proportionality, uh, that we at least retain what we currently uh, have, in our party conference in April, the Labour Party agreed for the first time that the Assembly needed more members than it currently has to discharge those responsibilities and will now embark on a round of discussions about how those members should best be elected. It will not be possible to conclude those things in a way that could get you a majority in the Assembly this side of an election and get all the legislation that will be necessary and all the electoral arrangements with a new map potentially, and new boundaries and new mm. constituencies all in place within uh, two years. But I would hope that, just in the Labour Party's uh, point of view, that we will be able to go into that election with a set of proposals in our manifesto uh, that if we were to be part of a government the other side of that election, we would have that mandate, mandate through a manifesto to bring about some of the changes that the McAllister Review has recommended to us. Thank you for that. We are sadly going to have to stop there. There are all kinds of questions you could have asked, I'm sure, where you have not touched on how much income tax might diverge, particularly if Wales ends up short of money after Brexit, nor have I indeed asked you whether you might thank George Osborne for lifting the tolls on the Seven Bridge, all those tantalizing things for another conversation. Um, thank you for your questions. Those of you who have not seen our excellent report out on Tuesday on devolution at 20 years, uh, the, the, the data side of that, produced by Akash Pound, uh, Lucy and Aaron, who I can't see here, but I think is on the premises somewhere, uh, Aaron Chung, uh, please do look at that. Uh, more to come over this summer. And for the moment, can you join me in thanking Mark Rayford?